a trafficking survivor named Liz that we worked with said, I was trafficked through 26 international airports over 15 years. And I just wish that somebody had asked me how I was doing or if I knew where I was. One of the number one cues that these are human trafficking victims is that they are arriving into cities where they're actually going up to someone saying, excuse me, can you tell me what city I arrived in? I mean, that's so bizarre and out of context with how much we have connectivity on our phones. But these are not people with, you know, just moving around on the apps on their phone and everything. This is like they have one phone number in their phone or two, and that is all that they are allowed to connect with. And so even though you can be surrounded by so many people, you can also feel extremely isolated and alone. Hello and welcome. I'm Eric Corum, and you're listening to The Blueprint Podcast, where we explore the journey of high performance by learning from the struggles and triumphs of some of the most interesting people in the world. Betty Ann Hagenow is a human rights and anti-slavery activist that founded the Bay Area Anti-Trafficking Coalition. In this episode, we discuss what she learned from interviewing former traffickers in the San Quentin State Prison, how they recruit, and what we can do to disrupt their patterns. This is a timely podcast as January is National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. Whether you have 10 minutes, 10 days, or 10 months, Betty Ann provides specific actions you can take to end human trafficking. If you find today's podcast valuable, go to www.ericquorum.com and sign up for my high-performance newsletter. In this newsletter, I provide you valuable resources and information to help you pursue audacious goals thrive in uncertainty, and live a healthy and fulfilled life. But now, it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Well, Betty Ann, I'm excited to have you on today. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. It's not every day that you meet somebody that is on the front lines of human trafficking. And how did you get interested in this? Or how did you get sucked into this? And now you're leading such an amazing organization in the Bay Area. Like, What's the story behind this? Mm. There definitely isn't just a a linear path for sure. But one of the things for me, Eric, was I was going along. I was a college basketball player. I played for the University of Oregon Ducks. And uh, I was really focused on, you know, kind of achievement and achieving my highest kind of personal and athletic goals. Well, when I graduated college and every college athlete has to go through that of kind of like, what do I do with life now that nobody cares about my free throw percentage or if I can hit a three pointer? You know, I went through this stage of just really, I just felt like I had so many interests and different things, but there really was this seminal moment in my life where I felt like I stopped asking myself, what am I good at? And I actually started asking myself some tougher questions around what keeps me up at night. And that came from a journey of actually being exposed to some speakers, both through some community groups and at my church around conversations around social justice and around human trafficking and other things. And so I just kind of wanted to show up in the dialogue. And I didn't really know my role. I mean, I was one of those people that then applied to go to Stanford for graduate school because I heard they had a degree where I could tailor it to be international conflict resolution. Mm. And I, uh, I didn't even know what I really wanted to do with it. I kind of wanted the degree to help me figure it out. So I kind of went in with a love for the world and for a passion for looking at human rights abuses. And it was partly through that program, partly through kind of just hanging out in the Stanford community and in the Menlo Park community, where then I had my first exposure to conversations around international human rights and different approaches to fighting it. Now, when was this? That was right around the year uh, 2000. That was when I ended up getting my degree at Stanford in international policy studies. And I did focus in conflict resolution, which I have to say, highly interesting, but also very highly unemployable. So I got (laughs) done. (laughs) I, I didn't know what I would do with it. But I ended up kind of going into this path of saying, okay, at least this is directing me into this place of understanding that I have this heart for human rights abuses. I'm looking at different groups around the world that are looking to fight them and then really trying to find my place on that continuum of how could I step in with who I was, kind of what my background was, what my passion was, and uh, and really step in and fight, you know, a huge issue. Something like human trafficking is considered the fastest growing criminal activity in the world. So this is a long fight. It's a big Mm -hmm. fight. Oftentimes, I kind of tell people, they, they ask me, you know, how do I fight trafficking with you? And I'm like, it's not the posture of a boxer, you know, with the gloves up and just kind of ready to punch somebody out. 
you know, that's tiring. Even somebody mm-hmm. holding up their hands like that, you can't hold them up that long before you start to feel the fatigue of all your muscles being tightened against something so horrific. And so what it has meant is actually opening my hands, looking at who I can partner with, who's interested in this issue with me. Look at the people that are wanting to fight it with me. And that's truly been the whole story has just been having a group of friends that wanted to stand against this with me. And then that becoming a nonprofit that becoming the Freedom Summit, one of the big events that we did that became the largest anti-trafficking community training in the country. So, you know, we just kind of showed up and then presented ourselves and, and then things have come around that. Wow. Now, you did talk to me earlier about the International Justice Mission, and that was kind of like the first step before you got to the um, Bay Area Anti-Trafficking Coalition. So what, what was that process like right there? Yeah, so IJM is now somewhat considered a household name because it is one of the largest anti-slavery organizations in the entire world. Uh, But at the time, International Justice Mission was not very well known. They were in D.C., and um, I heard the, the founder, Gary Haugen, come speak at Menlo Park Presbyterian Church. And I remember that uh, at the end of his talk, I remember I had my parents in town and I thought, oh, I'm so excited for them to hear my pastor speak. And instead, there was this lawyer with a crew cut from Washington, D.C. Doesn't who was that always open, happen? Right? And I'm like, who is this guy? So he actually totally tapped into my athletic past, which was at the end of his sermon. And he had presented some really crazy statistics and real pictures about the issues of trafficking and um, many more human rights abuses that IJM works on. Uh, you know, he presented those. And, and at the end of it, he said, and I actually, I haven't thought about this in a while, Eric, but he said, you know, um, he said, we're all like athletes that go to the gym and we're working on our muscles for a sport. And he said, but honestly, all of us in this room, we're really like kind of pumping up our muscles for the game of life, right? Mm. You don't want to just come and be inspired. You actually want to feel like those muscles go out in the world and make a difference Mm. for yourself, for your family, for the world at large. And so I remember him just saying like, you know, so what happens like when you go into the weight room, the people who really know what they're doing are the bodybuilders, right? And they're sitting in the corners and they pump their muscles and they just have gleaming muscles and these really tight t-shirts and that you think they've got it all figured out, right? But he said, but the only time all that strength and all that power ever comes to bear is when they're in the kitchen and a jam jar needs to be popped. And they're like, <laughs> oh, oh, I gotcha, I gotcha. And so they run over there and they pop the jam jar, right? Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, he said, my prayer for all of you is that you wouldn't be bodybuilders just popping jam jars in the kitchen. Mm. And I remember just being really moved by that of like, yes, I have grown up in a place of feeling like I have a heart for justice. I feel like I have muscles that are ready to be flexed in the world. And where can I be used? And so that's when I actually approached IJM and said, I think I'm your gal for the West Coast. Mm. And uh, they hired me as the first person outside of the East Coast. I was the only person west of the Mississippi. And I was basically sharing about IJM's mission and about what they did. And through that process of sharing their mission and their vision of how to stand against human trafficking, I really found my own voice in it and how much I was very passionate about having our local communities here in the state of California, understand how much human trafficking was happening here. Hmm. This is almost 20 years ago now. Yeah. And you're standing this up on the West Coast all by yourself. Was it lonely at all? You know, the interesting thing is I was kind of just known as the anti-trafficking lady doing stuff on my own because I was very much isolated. And even IJM said, we're not, there's no office out there. It's in your living room, right? So here I am at the time, a single person working from my home, kind of from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m., talking about kids in brothels and horrific things around the world. And yet I didn't even have a dog to walk around the block. I didn't, you know, I was traveling so much with the organization that I didn't uh, really have time to invest that much in my local community. Mm. And so I felt challenged after about three years with that group of challenging myself of saying, this is absolutely 
has tapped me out in a way of knowing that I want to really dive in deeper on the local level. And yet I'm not sure I can do that if I stay with this huge organization that is growing at lightning speed. And so one of my biggest challenges personally was to say, can I still be about justice if I don't work for a full-time justice mission? Mm. (laughs) And so when I left IJM, it was really a journey for me personally of saying, how could I actually mobilize my friends, mobilize the local Bay Area community to understand how much this is happening here? And what would it look like for me to find people that, yeah, I could actually say, like, come into this with me. And so those same 12 friends that ended up starting the first Freedom Summit with me, and we had an event, and Condoleezza Rice agreed to be one of our speakers, and we had uh, Sarah Groves and a couple other musicians show up, and all of a sudden we had almost 2,000 people come. And, I mean, you should have seen us on the phone ordering more sandwiches and figuring (laughs) things out. Never had, um, you know, that we didn't have that insight into that it would be quite so large for our first showing. And since then, I kind of sat in the facility at the end of the conference and I felt like I got this image of a rocket taking off in the Bay Area. And what my calling was, was to help shepherd the rocket, right? To kind of help keep it on course. Because there were all these different groups that said they fought trafficking, whether it was internationally or maybe something locally. But everybody just had a little bit of money and a little bit of an idea. And sometimes in the nonprofit world, that Silicon Valley entrepreneurship can splinter everyone and can have them just kind of go into their own silos. And so because of my conflict resolution background, I was like, hey, traffickers are very well networked, right? They know how to really use technology, really how to build a network. We need to be networked in our efforts against trafficking. So that's when we took those 30-something nonprofits that came to that event said, let's all figure out who's doing what and how to work together. And that's where we really built the coalition name in the beginning, was being the Bay Area Anti-Trafficking Coalition, where everybody could be who they were in their nonprofit sense, but we could also build this continuum to be able to share where we were doing things well, where we needed to share best practices, and then also where to name where the gaps were. Wow. This is pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you're in the heart of innovation, the heart of entrepreneurship, where they're looking for unicorns and you essentially created a unicorn uh, with, <laughs> with the help of a bunch of other folks. I mean, but sure. you told me in our previous conversation that there were a lot of people in the Bay Area that were kind of like, this isn't happening here. What was, what was the thing that kind of let the scales fall off their eyes? Yeah, great question. So, very well-educated people in San Francisco, all the way down to San Jose and into the East Bay, I would have these conversations, which I had very much been used to starting because of my background with IJM, Mm -hmm. but very quickly people wanted to move it to this, you know, almost like missional space of being like, oh, I'd have to get on an airplane to go help them, you know, or Mm -hmm. I could pay to just have that work well there. But when you really came down to trafficking happening in the Bay Area, there was actually four myths that we felt like we had to really help people get over. And that was, it wasn't just happening to girls, it's happening to boys. Mm -hmm. It's not just sex trafficking, it is labor trafficking of all kinds. It is not just foreign nationals. Actually, the majority of victims in California are American citizens. And lastly, just the fact that it happens here and it doesn't just happen elsewhere. And so really walking with people and understanding that is where we found ourselves. Again, I'm kind of this person with my conflict resolution background that once I learn something, I kind of want to turn around and I want to bring a hundred people with me. And so we just wanted to actually just scale that the best we could around the Bay and say, first, we have to get the water line up to make sure that everybody understands that it is happening here. If you're staring somebody, it's like meeting somebody on an airplane that you went to high school with. It's so out of context that you're like, where do I know you from again? Right? Yes. So yes. We have to have people's awareness up just so that when they're in their everyday spheres of influence or whether they're just moving around their own local neighborhood or going to their local coffee shop, that they could have their eyes and ears attuned to the fact that they might spot human trafficking. Wow. Now, I know that you, this is very interesting to me, but as you were doing research on what was happening in the Bay Area, you started interviewing human traffickers in San Quentin Prison. What was that like? Yes. While pregnant, I guess we should add. Oh, geez. (laughs) Yeah. First of all, Um, what made you decide (laughs) to like go to the root source? 
Yeah. Well, you know, honestly, a lot of the uh, conversation, and as I mentioned, a lot of my passion is kind of showing up in the dialogue and just seeing where it goes. And so there's no way that I could say I made that happen. It was very much through um, a series of relationships over a number of years. And we were actually asking a friend of ours in San Francisco to consider being a board member of ours. And she said, well, you know, I actually am, I'm really connected with this uh, gal who goes into San Quentin and she has been going in for years and she's just started asking questions about human trafficking. And all of a sudden she's gotten connected with some of the former like major traffickers in the state. And they are sharing with her how they ran their business, what were some of the key things that they needed in order to make their enormous profits. And uh, she said, so we're, we're starting to go in about every month, you know, any reason you, let me just see if you could come with us. Would you want to? <laughs> so that's how that happened. Wow. Um, so I showed up with a group of about seven people and we did go through all the gates of San Quentin on about a like at first kind of every other month and then quarterly basis to meet with this group of guys, some of whom were former traffickers. And definitely you could say, well, what was their motive and this and that? These were men that had really gone through restorative justice work who Mm -hmm. were owning much around their responsibility of the crimes they had committed and were willing to say, hey, I've got kids now that my main goal in life is that they don't get in the correctional system. So we had one trafficker who we were working with who was in there for 199 years to life. Mm. And he has um, multiple children that he said, you know, my biggest pride now is that none of my kids are in the correctional system. And I spend my one phone call that I can checking in on them and making sure that they're making smarter decisions. But these guys said that, and this is so key, Eric, in understanding the issue of human trafficking, is that we all look at victims of human trafficking, whether it's, you know, young men or young women or even older folks who have gotten into an exploitative labor situation and sex being one of those forms of labor. But we look at those victims and we say, how did they get there? What kind of environment? You know, what about their self-esteem? What about early exposure to drug abuse, domestic violence, substance abuse? And we start to back the, you know, we, we focus on the victim. But when you talk to these traffickers, they would tell you the reason that I'm so good at trafficking is because I came out of that same environment. I came out of an environment where I had early exposure to drug abuse. I was physically abused. I was sexually abused. All sorts of abuses that they said I was so objectified and I was so put in this condition that I could go to a school today and I could sit in front of a school and I could in 30 seconds tell you which girl that I would approach because I can just analyze her from with my own eyes of looking at her insecurities, of who's a loner, of who's looking for love, who, you know, I can look at their Instagram and see what they're frustrated about Mm -hmm. and that they're looking for connection. And so really the trafficker is coming out of the same environment that the victim is. And I think that's actually really important to remember just because when we sat with these guys in San Quentin, so many of them actually asked to sit with the district attorneys who had actually prosecuted them. And we made that day happen in San Quentin one time. We brought in um, a number of district attorneys from around the state. And people in the district attorney's office would say, well, the reason I got into this work was I was abused as a child. I was exposed to all this, you know, substance abuse, X, Y, Z. And they took the route of, I'm going to fight it in law. And these Mm. other guys chose the route of, obviously, this is a business that I was around as a kid, and now I'm going to be good as as an adult. So kind of finding that common past was super interesting for me, just in the realm of understanding why traffickers would do this. When you Mm. sit there and you go, how could you ever sell another human being, right? For any kind of service to make a profit. And so kind of understanding their world was a big part of it for me. And then the biggest thing that impacted our Bay Area Anti-Trafficking Coalition work, which we are still leaning into today, is that they said, you know what? You've done enough on the general awareness front, right? People believe it happens here now. But they said where you really would disrupt my business if you actually went to those nexus points where I need to move, work, and sleep my victims in order to make my profits and to run my business. And that's so what if you, you call go to the airports, front lines. Yeah. That's right. So you go to the frontline employees, you train at airports, you train at bus stations and rail stations and all sorts of people working in healthcare. You know, you look at apartments and property managers and you talk to these people who, you know, when they get dressed for work every day, they are uniquely positioned to see trafficking on almost a daily basis. And so that's where we've really put our muscle in now is to actually saying, we're not just out there trying to train everyone. 
we're legitimately going to these frontline industries and saying, if you get trained here, you're actually shutting down a trafficker's business and some of them will get out of the business altogether. That is amazing. So since you've been doing this, have you guys seen, like, have you had stories come back where people are like, hey, because of your training, we are able to spot X, Y, or Z, or we were able to stop this or anything like that? Yeah, you know, we're still on the front end of getting a lot of that data back, but mm-hmm. just a couple of vignettes, right? One is airports weren't really aware that this was even coming through them, like through mm-hmm. their hallways. I mean, they would say, oh, yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we trained a couple hundred people. Well, you know, there's 40,000 people that work at SFO. There's, I think it's now 59,000 people that work at LAX. These are mi- cities, you yeah. know, people that are going to work every day. And so really training up people to know what to look for and to trust their gut that if they see something that's off, that they might say something is a huge effort across these airports, right? So like, what's, give me an example of something that somebody may see that you would be like, that is something you need to report. Sure. So definitely there's always the um, places like restrooms, right? Where somebody might be crying in a stall or on their cell phone and actually calling someone and saying, I need help or I'm stuck in a situation. There's that. But there's also physical bruising, tears. Sometimes we look at branding. Some of these uh, individuals are actually branded with things that have all about daddy or a barcode or things like that. But you can also just honestly by, let's say you were sitting next to somebody getting ready to board a plane, right? And you're going to Chicago in the middle of winter, but the girl next to you has on shorts and a tank top or no luggage at all. And you're flying across country, right? With, she had no jacket. All she's got is her phone. That's pretty questionable, right? In the middle of winter to be flying mm-hmm. to Chicago with no jacket. So those things used to just be looked at as odd. And those are actually now really key signs of possibly something is awry. Now, one of the things that we've noticed too is that traffickers can easily use airports because they don't have to worry about the Amber Alert system that's on the roadways, right? There's nobody looking out for them if they were to say have just taken somebody or abducted somebody. But a lot of these traffickers actually know these individuals. They have been grooming them. They can tell them to do certain things. They can tell them to meet them somewhere. But then at an airport, you can just drop them off at the curb and say through your phone, like when you get into San Diego, so-and-so is going to pick you up. So a story would be, uh, for instance, that a gal came into SFO from Florida. Uh, She spoke English. I won't say what country um, that she was originally from, but something got mixed up in who was supposed to pick her up. So she actually stayed in the airport for 30 hours. Well, it turned out that uh, finally, after 30 hours, right, she had kind of no recourse. She really didn't know what to do. And so she approached a uniformed officer and said, I'm afraid to go outside because he sells me for sex. So that Mm -hmm. right there is like, you know, SFO wasn't actually hearing those stories. FBI and Department of Homeland Security who have offices at the airport, when their officers would get approached, they would just take care of it and move it off site at the airport. We've now built much more of a continuum of communication so that an airport understands this isn't just happening, you know, once in a great while. Yeah. A trafficking victim even presenting themselves to a uniformed law enforcement officer at the Bay Area airports is happening more like weekly versus once a year. So it was a huge eye opener for these airports of how much this was happening. And that's somebody actually even coming up to a uniformed officer. That's not just a victim trying to pass through an airport. So the numbers around kind of, well, Betty Ann, how big of a problem is this? Mm -hmm. I think that's where we always get caught up, but we have to look at it as a continuum of these airports didn't think anything was coming through there. And now they're willing to understand that this is happening on a much more regular basis, leading to stickers in restrooms saying, do you need help? Mm -hmm. Uh, Leading to all sorts of training so that people could call something in. And then not just training employees, Eric, but the other thing that really makes the impact is actually really helping them assess their protocols so that you actually have an airport that says, we have a great emergency response system in place. And that's been somewhat of our secret sauce, if you will, of really helping these airports be able to potentially intervene for these victims while they are still in their airport. This is not general human trafficking training. This is not, hey, look for it once you get to your home community. This is if you see it in an airport, here's what you do so that that victim could potentially get help while they are in the airport. It's amazing to me that there's so much control that these traffickers have. They could put somebody on an airplane with a phone, with a phone, And they will go across the country to where they tell them to go. And I mean, there's just that much control and power because I would think to myself, like if, 
if I was in a situation and I'm not obvious, you know what I'm saying? Like I would be finding a way out. Like I have a phone, I'm in an airport, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But um, that is, that's very scary. Um, yeah, if I could offer, there's one quote that we often offer, which is a trafficking survivor named Liz that we worked with who said, I was trafficked through 26 international airports over 15 years. And I just wish that somebody had asked me how I was doing or if I knew where I was. One of the number one cues that these are human trafficking victims is that they are arriving into cities where they're actually going up to someone saying, excuse me, can you tell me what city I arrived in? I mean, that's so bizarre and out of context with how much we have connectivity on our phones. But these are not people with, you know, just moving around on the apps on their phone and everything. This is like they have one phone number in their phone or two, and that is all that they are allowed to connect with. And so even though you can be surrounded by so many people, you can also feel extremely isolated and alone. So for somebody to just ask you, you know, hey, what are you going to be doing in San Francisco? You know, would actually alert somebody to thinking they didn't even know they were they were arriving in San Francisco. Um, I, the other thing is, is that we are looking at apartment complexes. And one of the important things to understand about this COVID time period is so many businesses that were storefronts will not reopen after mm-hmm. this time that has been so difficult for the economy. And uh, one of those is a lot of massage businesses that were doing all kinds of illicit activity behind scenes or offering much more than a massage. And there is an estimate that over 60% of those illicit massage businesses will not reopen and they will all move their business to apartments and hotels. Hence the reason why when we look at our move, work, sleep model, we look at where these victims are sleeping, where they're also made to work, and that is why we are honing in on apartments and properties where traffickers can also house their victims. Wow. So it also would be interesting to educate the people in the apartments. Cause like if I'm in my neighborhood and I see something weird going on, like usually you would confer with a neighbor and they're like, oh, maybe, like, you know, I actually lived when I actually was in California, there was like a grow house in the, in the area. It was a really nice house. Nobody would have known. And then it got busted one day and we're like, you got to be kidding me. That was just right. And they had like this very yeah. intricate, like irrigation system coming through the house. But um, it's scary to know that like this stuff could be happening literally underneath you if you're in an apartment or above you and you would have no idea. Yeah. So the latest statistic we've seen is that 50% of the Bay Area actually rents, right? And some of that is Mm -hmm. houses, but a large of that is high density housing. And so we are really leaning into talking to property owners, property managers, and then also the maintenance staff and other employees that work on site. And there's some specialized training that needs to differ for those because obviously the more that you might live on site, the more you might be hesitant to give some kind of tip if it means that your own personal safety is going to be threatened. And so we're working in that community now. And um, you're right, Eric, it's a place where we're definitely interested in moving. So not only are we hitting kind of the owners and the property managers, Mm -hmm. but coming in 2021, if people go to our website, baatc.org, you can go to our training site and on the apartments tab, you can sign up to get, if you live in an apartment, how to get our training about what to look for if you are renting. I'm glad you mentioned that. So if people want to get training for their organization, if you're in the Bay Area, it's baatc.org. What if you live in Houston, Texas, for say, like where I'm at, like how would somebody go about going, I I need need some training for, I know a friend that owns an apartment complex or whatever. Yes. Well, our trainings definitely are not Bay Area specific by any means. And we actually are kind of looking at broadening our name and whatnot because we've kind of been leaning into this training foray and now it really has taken off to the point we um, need to consider a much more national push. Mm. But uh, the one thing I would say is feel free to still contact us through the site just at hello at BAATC.org. And uh, we end up talking to people all over the country and we've got a ton of uh, partners and friends in the Houston area and in Texas in general. But, you know, training apartments, yes. And, you know, we're working through the airports if anybody has any interest in helping us get a new contact at a new airport. Obviously, we're grateful for that. But um, the learnings around how to get these trainings integral to where people live and work is extremely interesting because if you look at it, it's the exact opposite of talking to people about it happening overseas, right? You're actually now saying it's not just happening in your community, it's happening where you go to work every day or it's happening where you live. And when that happens, it gets really vulnerable for people. It gets really, you know, people can start to react out of a fear rather than out of a place of empowerment. And so we say we like to make people feel like they can become dangerous and dangerous in the best sense, right? Like dangerous to know enough 
that they could know how to report something in an anonymous and safe way, but in a way that really could help an individual um, seek out that freedom that we get to enjoy every day. And so it's one of those things where we are kind of eager to have people lean into knowing what they do, where they live and where they work so that, you know, we can feel like we don't have these victims living in the midst of our neighborhoods. It very much is a injustice hiding in plain sight, we say. It's really in the shadows of our communities. And we all can do something to bring the light. No question. I mean, this is January, which is anti-trafficking month. And it's really sad to say that we have to have a month dedicated to this. But if I'm, you know, like, like we just discussed, if I'm in Oklahoma or wherever I'm tuning in from and listening, we can reach out to you. We can reach out to your organization. But like, do you know of like community groups to get educated on this or churches or like other ways that people can get involved if they, if they don't work at an airport or they don't work at a, a, you know, an apartment complex? Like, what would you say to the average person? Like, what can the average person do to help stop this in their community? Great question. It's a month that actually I really credit the government for actually putting on the calendar because yes, it's a difficult conversation to have, but it is such a motivator for employers, for friend groups, for households to actually just ask themselves, how could we take a step forward in knowing more about trafficking, right? Mm -hmm. And what could we do in our local communities to potentially recognize and report it happening here? So I'm grateful for that month. Uh, The other thing is January 11th is actually National Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Day. And so a lot of people will organize just whether it's a walk outside or it's a conversation via Zoom or a book club or something. That's a great day to mobilize around as well. But one of the things you ask, Eric, is kind of what just can the everyday person do? And and that's really been a passion area for me because honestly, you can start out on such a level with this issue where you can say there's over, you know, 2 million children a year that are trafficked. It's a $152 billion industry. It's in almost every country in the world. And people can just get bolted to their chair in despair, right? And they kind of look at you and go, well, good for you. Or gosh, this is a big enough issue. This should be a law enforcement issue, right? And we actually need everyone to be in the army that is standing against this because it is so hidden in plain sight. I actually had a case here in my local neighborhood and it was a case where a gal who was a foster youth was putting herself up online and selling herself. And it took kind of a community coming around her to understand that there was this trafficker in her life that was encouraging her to do that. And really understanding, you know, some of the the polls on Instagram and on other, um, you know, whether it's TikTok, whether it's all these different applications where young people are getting kind of lured into these circles, especially when they might be saying, ah, I've been stuck at home with my family for COVID and I'm ready to get out. People are there to prey on them online and for parents to have those conversations Mm -hmm. with their young adults and preteens about people that may be in their spheres online that they don't really know. There was a local case here in the in the Bay Area where a set of twins actually connected with somebody online and went to a mall to meet them and they did get kidnapped from there and they were found being promoted on one of these sites online selling them for sex. I mean, it happens. But the place I don't want us to act out of is, well, my kids should never go to the movies again or my, yeah. you know, I should never let my kids out. Again, this is more like the ways that people kind of seep into young people's lives and then start grooming them for that time when they do have an argument with their mom, when they do Mm -hmm. feel like getting out of the house and they say, hey, I'll come meet you or I'll pick you up or I'll give you that ride or I'll buy you that sweater that your parents wouldn't. So those are the cues to really watch for. But the everyday person standing against this, we put it on a continuum because so many people are like, you know, I'm so sad to hear it's happening here, but how do I not act out of fear? We ask people to put it on a continuum of what could you do in 10 minutes, 10 days, and 10 months? Because to anybody, if you're like me, I'm like, I could just come away from a conversation about this and I could maybe be excited for five minutes or I'd want to read a book. But then sometimes life happens and you're just pulled in different directions. And so in 10 minutes, you could put the National Human Trafficking Hotline number in your phone, right? 888-3737-888. Again, 888-3737-888. Or you could look up something of the Polaris Project, and they are the folks who run the national hotline. There's another website called End Human Trafficking Now, End HT Now. There's all sorts of kind of national campaigns. But what I would not encourage somebody to do is just start like Googling human trafficking, start watching every video that pops up. 
that is how I have seen the biggest emotional kind of burnout because people just go into it. And then 10 minutes later, they're completely overwhelmed by the brutality and brainwashing that is a reality. Mm. You have to find a way to move in this that is sustainable and that you could stay you know, in the fight for a long period of time. So then, you know, I just encourage people within 10 days to talk to somebody about it. Don't be alone in it, right? Bring along a partner, a roommate, a family member, somebody who might be interested in just pursuing it, of looking into it a little bit more. Find out about what groups are working in your area. And then in 10 months, obviously, you could say, gosh, you could plan a fundraiser, you could do a bike ride, you could uh, try and volunteer with an organization. And you can always come back to organizations like ourselves that kind of have the vantage point of like, say, an entire region and who's doing what, Mm -hmm. and just ask us where you'd like to connect. We tend to break the issue down into three different areas. We kind of call it prevention or advocacy, intervention, and aftercare. And I really ask people a lot of times, you know, do you feel like you're somebody that would want to like fight for new laws or would you want to be out there doing trainings that help prevent future trafficking? Or are you somebody that like wants to bust down the doors of those illicit massage businesses and you want to join the police on those raids at hotels? And I definitely say, talk to us before you go do that, please. But, you know, we sign them up (laughs) for something like that. Uh, And there are groups that will go out and like interact with victims of trafficking and try and help them either get out of the life or or to um, seek help. And then there's the aftercare groups, right, that really work on restoration and work on this um, long journey of recovery, not only psychologically, but emotionally and physically, job searches, you know, language skills, things like that. And there's people that are very apt at helping in that realm. So if people can kind of take the time to plot it out a little bit of what could I do now and a little bit in the future and a little in the far off future. And then also what am I kind of uniquely designed for or the prevention realm, the intervention realm or the aftercare. I tell you, you'll save yourself a lot of time about flailing of kind of where do you fit in the movement? Because it's a big enough issue that it does affect us all. And Mm -hmm. it used to be something that I mentioned at dinner parties and everybody would say, oh, wow, she works on trafficking. I'm going to, excuse me, I need to go get something to eat. And now they all the time, I mean, I haven't been at a dinner party in a while with COVID, but people will approach me all the time and say, Betty Ann, did you see this article or my friend's friend or, you know, my daughter's young daughter um, had a kid at school that was approached. So we have to understand that it is hitting all age groups. It is hitting all demographics, both very wealthy communities and very poor. It's something that doesn't just touch on a certain, you know, place in our communities. It is, it is really rampant throughout. Yeah. I think that whole Epstein documentary that came out, you know, really shone the light on like, this is, I mean, it's in very affluent places. It's, it's everywhere. And it's not something that, um, that only touches a certain demographic right. and only touches a certain socioeconomic class or whatever. It, it's honestly, as a parent of three kids, it's rather frightening. You know, something I want to ask you about is, is what is the role that pornography plays in all this? Mm. Well, it's a long journey I've had of kind of looking into that. I would say that one of our first eye-opening moments was my co-founder, Brian Woe and myself, when we started the Bay Area Anti-Trafficking Coalition. One of the places we were most passionate and had kind of the most open doors to come speak and talk about this issue was the same faith communities who had hosted people like Gary Haugen from IJM. And so we spoke to a lot of faith communities and it was first the pastors who came to us and said, you know, trafficking is mainly touching my community because I just know of so much pornography that is rampant throughout. Mm -hmm. And that is actually significant to, and I think representative of our overall population. That's not just unique to faith communities. It is definitely kind of a hidden vice within many communities. And just these, the profits that these sites are making and whatnot is just unreal. And if you were to look up right now, the big one is Pornhub. And there's some real groups that are standing against how much they are promoting promoting sex with children and whatnot. And there's been some huge efforts and initiatives against some of their work. But, um, you know, there was the fight to take down the adult ads on Craigslist there are sites like Rub Maps that you can tell what you got at a massage parlor. Um, there's so many things in the dark web. Mm. You know, it really, it truly is just, it's just darkness. But for people to igno- understand that this is not separate, you know, from trafficking in the sense that so many of those people that are in the pornography industry are not there by choice. They are being drugged. They are being threatened. Uh, this is not something they are doing 
uh, on their own free will. Mm -hmm. And so the very kind of addictive nature of pornography and how much it's being viewed, the profits that are being turned from that, and therefore how many people are kind of taken into those realms is truly horrific. So it is something where we found some people who have really risen up in the anti-trafficking movement to stand specifically against pornography and how do you kind of go, uh, you know, towards these websites and whatnot to either get them shut down or to understand how you could actually in some way move things in a different way. And the reason I mentioned that shutting down a site is not always right away seen as a great thing is because sometimes like when Craigslist went down, a lot of law enforcement was like, that's where we went to, to find all the victims, right? Mm -hmm. So we went there to find who had gone missing. And then we found them on there. And then we put up a fake ad and we met up with them and we were able to. So when those things sometimes get shut down, the immediate response oftentimes of law enforcement also is, oh, our work just got a lot harder because it mm -hmm. just goes more and more underground. So one of the recent things right now has just been that even the credit card companies actually have the algorithms now where they don't have to accept charges that are coming from pornographic sites. Now that is a very creative way to fight this, right? Mm. So somebody goes in, they just want to purchase whatever they've normally done on their site. And all of a sudden that's not, it's declined, right? That shuts down the business of pornography in the same way as we are looking to shut down the business of trafficking, mm -hmm. where these traffickers need to move, work, and sleep their victims. If we just look at it as this horrific crime of humanity, you know, you can just get overwhelmed with the sentiment of it. And I think for those of us who are trying to at least stay in the fight for a long period of time, you look for those places where you can take the big swings at the business. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm personally very thankful for the work that you're doing and um, the fight that you're fighting and your stamina. I mean, you really have an amazing affect and I'm very appreciative of that. And I appreciate you coming on today. And I want to finish with something kind of just a little bit more lighthearted, just just because it's kind of recent news. You are also the voice of the Stanford women's basketball team. And <laughs> If you're listening to this, you're like, wow, she's a really good speaker. Well, there's a reason. She's on the radio all the time. She's very confident. But Tara Vanderveer just recently tied Pat Summit's record, and she's going to overtake that very soon. And you've been with them for 22 years. Is that right? That's right. This is my 22nd season with the team. That's amazing. Maybe you could just shed a light for just a little, for just a moment or two about Coach Vanderveer and your experience doing that and uh, like how that happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, there. one of the things I would say about sustaining in the fight against trafficking is people finding hobbies and obviously diving deep into community and really being known by people and, and also just knowing how to have fun. I mean, when I first got into things and I was working for IJM, you know, I'd finish a full day of working for them. And then I'm like, you know, I haven't seen Hotel Rwanda yet. I should go home and watch that. I mean, I was so <laughs> hard on myself. And I just think that our freedom is often very tied up in the freedom that we fight for for others. And if we can't experience that ourselves, if we forget what that feels like, I do think our work in this area can get kind of convoluted or somewhat confusing. And so, mm -hmm. so, uh, so my outlets, yeah, in the winter times has been announcing Stanford women's basketball and the amount of people that have come to the Stanford games who are now big fans of BAATC uh, has been awesome. And, you know, I think it was two years ago with Alana Smith, uh, their big Australian player at Stanford, who's now in the WNBA. Uh, she actually helped us do the first ever Pac-12 day on human trafficking awareness at a Stanford women's basketball game. Wow. And just thousands of people in attendance. We had some human trafficking survivors perform at halftime. Wow. We had things up on the Jumbotron explaining about trafficking in the Bay Area and what to look for, encouraging people to find out more information. And it was truly the melding of my two worlds. So that was a beautiful life moment for me. But when I'm doing the announcing, yeah, I just started, I did start off coming out of college thinking I would get into sports broadcasting before I I did my master's in the conflict resolution world. And uh, so I started doing color play-by-play -play for Fox Sports Bay Area, an old network that's no longer there. And, uh, and so my first game was actually interviewing Tara about uh, a book that she had written when she was the 1996 Olympic coach, and it was Stanford playing Colorado. Mm. Anyway, that's, uh, that was back in the year 1997. And then um, she just came up to me and I was around campus because I was helping organize the women's basketball final four when it was in San Jose at the, the old HP pavilion or it used to be the compact center. And so we were organizing that event and she just came up to me and she is a woman of very few words sometimes. And she just said, you know, you should be our announcer. 
and uh, come for the, you know, just, we'll see ya. And I said, oh, oh gosh, coach, I'm honored, right? But that was in May or something. And so I thought, you know, season's not till November. Well, sometime in October, I saw around the athletic department and the event, the final four was now over and I was focused on going to grad school. And, and I went up to her and she said, I said, coach, when, when was that audition? And she just looked at me and this is only about two weeks before the first game. And she just looked at me and she's like, just come the first night. <laughs> so oh I just goodness. showed up. It was some exhibition team and they handed me a marketing binder and I literally had to go back into my brain of like, how did they announce us when I was in college <laughs> in the lineup and they would announce us coming out and we just figured it out from there. And then, you know, Ma- Maples underwent like a $27 million renovation Maples Pavilion where the Stanford Cardinal play and uh, they put in a big jumbotron. So then they introduced kind of having a headset on me and running the whole production of the commercials and all the marketing plus Mm -hmm. all the games you get to do with uh, people at halftime and things. And, you know, I've had a few bloopers over the years, but, but overall it's been um, absolutely this amazing learning experience. And I love the people I've been working with. Uh, Many of them have produced, you know, the giants and the A's and the 49ers and the Mm -hmm. Raiders And so I've been learning all about this kind of production of sporting events and uh, have really enjoyed where I could be in a seat where I kind of help people turn the game into an experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of been my joy is that when I see Tara have these amazing, you know, just freshmen that come in and make such an impact, part of what I'm thinking of is what's the kind of image that we're helping build for them, for them to be excited about being at Stanford for four years. So for instance, they had one gal who scored a ton. This was probably six years ago, seven years ago. And her name was Brooke Smith. I'm like, okay, it's not the most interesting name in the world, but she's going to score a lot. Yeah. So I need to figure out something. So one day I just showed up and she had this little mini hook shot she would do under the basket that was really sweet and would make the crowd go wild. And so she hit it one night in a big moment. And I just said, Brooke with the hook. And everybody uh, went nuts. Right. And so then, so then every time she did her little jump hook, you know, everybody in the crowd would, would say with me, Brooke with the hook. Or we'd have Carolyn Moose and everybody in the stadium when she scored, I'd Moose. say, Carolyn Moose. Yeah. <laughs> you find something for everybody. Um, but that also is to say they've had some of the toughest names uh, to say, I think, in the entire country. So we've had Eziamaka Okafor and Naomi Muatao Pele, Shevnam Kim Yajiolu, and more. And so you just get used to saying these gals' names off your tongue. And so it always has kept me on my toes. I've always enjoyed watching Tara and her team be so successful. Mm. And then to be there sitting in the front row where she keeps hitting these milestones, right? Hits a thousand victories. Uh, the other night, obviously at Cal, um, a few games back being the, the winningest coach, tying Pat Summit. You know, I remember the last game that Pat Summit came to Maples and we actually did a moment of silence and everybody shouted out to Pat because regardless of what team they were, you know, with, there was such an amazing women's basketball community that wanted to honor Pat Summit's last game because mm. she knew it was her last game, right? She had early stage dementia and she knew her health was going downhill and so she retired early. So everyone just really honored her. And then obviously when she passed, we obviously have done quite a bit to honor her when that happened. And there's been a number of world events that I've been sitting in the seat when that's happened and we've either done a moment of silence or whatnot, but it's been an incredible community that's kind of grown together over the time that Tara has been at Stanford that we've experienced much more than just basketball together. Wow. You are a fascinating person. I think you, you totally fit the bill of one of the most interesting people in the world. And and just in our couple conversations, there's so many other things I had on the list that I wanted to talk about. But I really want to thank you for being with us today and just reiterate that if people want to get a hold of you, they can get you at hello at BAATC.org, correct? That's a great way to get a hold of me, yes. Okay. I would say come see me in Maples Pavilion this season, but I will be announcing, but I will have a mask on and there only will be about 40 people in the stadium, which are Mm. the two teams and myself. So if you happen to catch us on, on air as well, you can give a shout out to the Stanford Cardinal. I love it. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much, Eric. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining me today on another episode of the blueprint podcast. If you found this episode valuable, Sign up for my high-performance newsletter at www.ericcorum.com. And if you want to stay current on everything high-performance, follow me on Instagram at Eric Quorum, Twitter at Eric Quorum, Facebook, and I'm also on LinkedIn.